What's Up, Doc Mike, Public Health on Call, by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for February 22, 2021. A COVID-19 long hauler shares his story. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 3 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Jim Golan, a home health nurse in Minnesota who contracted COVID early in the pandemic. He is what doctors now call a long hauler, still suffering from the effects of COVID-19 10 months after he first became ill. He talks about how difficult his journey has been and how he isn't sure whether he will recover. Let's listen. Jim Golan, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Stephanie. So Jim, we have you here today because you have been diagnosed with COVID. And you are, many months later, still experiencing a lot of symptoms. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind starting a little bit at the beginning. You became sick, I understand, in March. Yes. Tell me uh, how that happened. Okay. Uh, Well, my story, I'm a home care nurse. I started having symptoms of COVID about March 7th, including the severe shortness of breath, Oxygen sats dropping into the 80s, and fever, loss of taste and smell, just a crippling fatigue. I had the sore throat and the conjunctivitis, you know, the eye inflammation, and and the dreaded mental fog. I asked my doctor if there was a, if I could get help, and he said, "Only come in if you need a vent." Mm-hmm. So you didn't even come in, you didn't go to the hospital, you didn't go see the doctor, uh, you were too sick. Correct. I didn't for about a month. I called him every three days in that month and and I was told to just stay home. Um, when he finally did agree to see me, he tried to diagnose me with depression. Hmm. And uh, depression's not in my wheelhouse at all. It was, I was feeling a little down because I couldn't breathe, but... Um, Then three days later, an urgent care doctor talked to my wife on the phone and and he said, get him to the emergency room immediately because we're seeing blood clots in the lungs. And and that's a footprint for COVID. And if you think you had COVID, have them do a CT. I did that. And sure enough, I had blood clots in both of my lungs. That could have been really dangerous. So... They told me I was very lucky to be alive um, because I probably had these for over a month, right from the beginning. Um, I had a, a bad experience. I didn't have insurance for about two weeks. And I was out on, a, on the street within about 15 minutes of that diagnosis. So that not having insurance almost killed me. But um, after that, I started looking into the being a nurse, looking into the ER lab values that they did draw, and they had drawn a um, what's called the MCH. It was the only lab that was off. It was high, uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin. I learned, and it was. Um, I looked at Doctor Google, it, and it says that it, it's indicative of a B12 um, deficiency, and I had seen that in the support group that I had talked to. I had been following that other people were having B12 deficiencies with this, with COVID. And there were studies, research studies from the National Institute of Health saying that um, COVID will decrease the amount of B12 up that your stomach uptakes. So I asked for that um, test, and sure enough, I had a critically low B12. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this where do you think you got COVID? Um, 
I mean, you live in, you live in Northern Minnesota. I understand. Yes. I, I definitely got COVID from work. I, I, I'm a home care nurse. So I see a lot of sick patients in the home. I'm the nurse that goes in and sets up the start of care. So I do, I'm in the home for about two and a half hours doing assessments, getting up their plan of care all set up, as well as I go into assisted livings and long-term care facilities. Um, the mask policy at the time was we were not to wear masks because it would send the wrong impression if one were one nurse wore a mask and the others did not. Um, I think I got it from work also because we were encouraged to come to work when we were sick. Mm. Um, he said, if you have a cough, a terrible cough, you can just wear a mask. Mm. There are short nurses, so they needed people. Mm. But my biggest exposure was a, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> A team, team building meeting known as the huddles. It was um, every day all the staff members, including hospice and home care nurses, physical therapists, home health aides, even the office staff would get together for this meeting. There were no masks. Everyone was elbow to elbow. Um, and they would do, it was a team building. So it was, they'd ask questions like, are there any medication issues? Are there any computer issues? Has anyone had any good catches, any scheduling concerns? All, all of these type of things I, I thought could have been done by the email, but they had us all in one little room. And my, many of the people in this huddle, this, this meeting, arm in arm, were caring for patients at a local assisted living where 11 people died of COVID. So I know that I was exposed in that small room. Mm -hmm. Those 11 people were actually the first deaths in our county. Wow. From COVID. So you spent a lot of time at home and it was a while before people took your, your symptoms seriously. I guess you found a, a community online. Yes. Um, there were two groups, Survivor Corps and um, the Long Haulers group. Um, set up by Amy Watson, who's a long hauler herself. And um, it, it helped a lot to see that I was not alone. It, it was very strange to be on the other side. Um, I'm used to advocating for my patients in both the hospice and the home care, but people didn't want you to come in. They didn't want to get sick when I got ill and I was just told to stay home. So yeah, the online community was very, very important. And it was very nice when Dr. Fauci finally recognized the long haulers and, um, and CNN did as well and, and the other news outlets. What does your disease look like now? I get short of breath with exertion and with talking. Um, my, my biggest issue right now is the chest pain. It starts about two o'clock in the afternoon and by eight, nine o'clock at night, it is pretty severe. It feels like inflammation. The whole chest is just inflamed. Um, they, they've ruled out uh, acid reflux. I've, I've had endoscopies for that and we've tried Prilosec and that did nothing. So that's kind of where I'm at. I still get night sweats and insomnia, which I guess are really, uh, really, common with the uh, long haulers. Mm -hmm. And at first people didn't really believe that this was real. Right. It was, um, it, exactly. Um, they were, they keep saying that it's anxiety or it's depression. Um, I would say the, the hardest part is, um, about the whole thing was the loneliness because you are, you are alone, you're isolated. And, and seeing how being sick affected the others around me, not knowing from one day to the next whether you're going to wake up. That was probably the hardest part for my wife. And you're now being seen by doctors who take you seriously. I am. I've, after eight months, I've finally got some really good um, world-class doctors. I've, I've got a cardiologist, Dr. Brody, and a um, hematologist. Dr. Pravados, and they're both in Range Hipping Medical Center of all places. You'd think that um, to get that great a care, you'd have to go to a metropolis, but 
Um, they've been looking into researching what the next treatments are. They've uh, started me two days ago on the new ivermectin protocol um, just to see if that would help. Um, but they definitely believe me and they, um, they're working with me. So that was very nice. Mm -hmm. And you had moments when you didn't think you were going to make it. You said, I understand that you were able to celebrate something in December. Yes. My, um, there's been so much negative going on in my life with, uh, with the disease and losing my job and, uh, but on the positive side, I was able to attend my son's wedding, and that was in December. Uh, he's a cardiac nurse. He married the love of his life. He, she's an ICU nurse, and um, and they moved at that point, and they got COVID, but they're doing better. But um, during their vows, I just started thinking my own vows that I gave way back in 1988, and I wrote something for my wife about my wife, and it kind of shows what it's like to have long COVID, um, COVID at home. So would it be okay if I read it? Sure. Okay. It's called I Do. Um, I Do. They seem like two of the most innocuous words in the English language, and yet when spoken truly, they are the most powerful. In sickness and in health, she fought for me. She fought for me when the doctors would not. She coaxed me to turn and move so that my lungs could fill with precious air. She helped me walk when I could not stand by myself. She researched the internet to find support and treatments. And she was there when friends and coworkers distanced themselves. She cooked and fed me nutritious meals when I could not taste them. She took care of the dogs, the chickens, and the farm. When I was physically down, she could not and could not work. She got a better job. She drives two hours a day to support us. When I was feeling down, she was there telling me it would be okay. She was terrified and still is in the almost daily changes as the virus reduced my ability to interact with the world and enjoy my life. She is my world. Uh, my wife is definitely a keeper. She's my hero. Do I think I will be with her forever? I do. That was really moving, really beautiful. What advice do you have for others in the same situation you're in? Well, I would say to please wear a mask. Um, I truly believe that everyone, I would not have this if everyone in that huddle had worn a mask, everyone in that meeting, if the patients I was seeing who were sick and myself, when I was seeing them, could have wore a mask. And using a mask is not a political statement. It's not an infringement on freedoms. Um, I would ask people to have empathy for others and to remember the one simple fact that uh, wearing a mask is a simple act of kindness. Do the doctors think you're gonna get better? Right now, that's up in the air. My cardiologist says that I might have long-term lung damage because I still have shortness of breath. If you were ask, asking my workers' comp people, they would say, um, oh, he's better already. He's never had it. Um, when my employer ran out, unemployment ran out, rather, um, I tried to get help from workers' comp through my employer. And I had a really bad experience after two and a half hours of grueling, cruel deposition and a trip to Minneapolis to see their physician. Try driving that with great brain fog. <laughs> um, they dismissed me and said, oh, this is all anxiety and you didn't get it from work. Hmm. So my response to them was, um, I should go to Hollywood and I'm so good I can fake bilateral lung clots and B12 deficiencies. <laughs> So I know a lot of long haulers are going through the same issues, saying it's anxiety and depression, but it's very real. I still have the tachycardia, the increased heart rate, just walking across the room. And you used to run, right? Yes, I, I ran three miles a day. Um, didn't miss a day for a year. Wow. And uh, my pulse was usually around 55 to 60. 
and now it's um, 77 to up to 100 if I walk across the house. Like, what is what is your hope? What do you hope to do once? I mean, I know you want to get better, obviously. Um, and when you get better, what's the thing you really want to do the most? Well, we are going to be selling our house. Uh, my wife, I don't want her to have to drive the two hours again um, and move to Hibbing. They treated me so well up there. Uh, their doctors are so good. I'm going to go work up there. Um, what, what I'm really hoping... You want to be a nurse again? You want to be a nurse again? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. That That's who I am. It's... Um, I like advocating for people. If I see poop, people who can't who can't breathe, I try to do something about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it didn't work out so great for me, but it gives me a a point to go from to make things better for other people. Well, Jim Golan, thank you for sharing your story. I will keep you in my heart, hoping that you will someday soon feel better, feel like you used to. Thank you. I really appreciate it and. Thank you for bringing some light to the other long haulers and their suffering. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.